Simeon I is often seen as one of the greatest men in Bulgarian history, and he was certainly the most important man of the first Bulgarian Empire. He expanded Bulgaria's borders in order to make it bigger than it had ever been, and his reign is often seen as the zenith of the first Bulgarian Empire. At the time, many Bulgarians would have imagined that this vast Bulgarian Empire would last indefinitely. Of course, we now know that this isn't the case. The problem with history is that, in retrospect, it's easy to see how things will go wrong. If this was the zenith, we know that the only way is down. After all, Bulgaria today is a much smaller place than it was then. So, following his death, Simeon I was succeeded by his son, Peter I. During Peter's reign, the Bulgarian Empire was attacked by the Rus, a beta version of Russia, and the Byzantine Empire. The Bulgarian Empire also lost the territory of what is now Serbia. As such, it's easy to imagine that Peter I was a much worse ruler than his father. However, this isn't entirely accurate. To begin with, Peter I presided over an era of peace, church building, and art. He also managed to patch things up with the Byzantine Empire by marrying into the Byzantine royal family, much like how Meghan Markle is trying to help the US patch things up with the UK by marrying Prince Harry. This is probably her way of saying sorry about Trump. Still, as much as everyone loves a royal wedding, it didn't create long-term peace. After Peter I's Byzantine wife died, the Byzantine Empire decided that now would be a perfect time to invade Bulgaria with the help of the Rus. So the guy's wife dies and then his empire is invaded. That's gotta suck, right? After Peter I's reign, power was handed to Boris II for two years before being handed to Roman, who was castrated by the Byzantines in order to stop him from having any any offspring, and eventually the throne was then handed to Samuel. As the First Bulgarian Empire was more or less in a constant state of war and decline during this period, it makes sense that the last ruler of the First Bulgarian Empire was not a brother or a son of the castrated and imprisoned former ruler. Rather, he was the general of his army, because as the Bulgarian Empire had its back against the wall during these final decades, an army was pretty much all it had. During this time, Samuel ruled the First Bulgarian Empire, or what was left of it, from a castle in Ohrid, which which my girlfriend and I visited in early 2015 while on a five month backpacking trip around Europe. The castle is now inside the borders of the Republic of Macedonia and it still stands today. The Bulgarian Empire, however, would eventually fall and it is at this castle where it ceded to the Byzantine Empire in 1014. The rest of the Bulgarian Empire fell to the Byzantines in 1018. Jump forward to 1185 AD though, and the Byzantine Empire is beginning to fall itself, seeing the Byzantine Empire's slow degradation as their chance to shine Two aristocratic brothers, Aeson and Peter, established the Second Bulgarian Empire with Veliko Tarnovo as its capital. Why Veliko Tarnovo? Well, based on a map of Bulgaria today, you can see that it's much more central than previous capitals of Orid, which is no longer in Bulgaria at all, Preslav and Sofia. However, a second reason Aeson and Peter may have chosen Veliko Tarnovo is that it is bloody gorgeous. I mean, look at it. It was in this impressively beautiful city that the Bulgarians built an impressively beautiful castle from where they could rule a new empire, and for just over 200 years they did just that. Tsar Varets, the fortress at the centre of the Second Bulgarian Empire, is interesting because of the way in which it wasn't built around a palace, it was built around a church. As such, the Patriarch of Bulgaria, the head of the Bulgarian church, sat at the top of that hill in the centre of the Second Bulgarian Empire rather than the Emperor. It made sense in a way. After all, it was thanks to Bulgarian Christianity and the Bulgarian translation of the Bible mentioned in the last video that Bulgaria had its own language and its own national identity. Even though the emperors of the Second Bulgarian Empire were the ones in charge, they recognised the role a religious leader played in uniting the nation. In 1196, Kaloyan, the younger brother of Asin and Peter, became the ruler of the Second Bulgarian 
Bulgarian Empire. It was under his bloody rule that the Second Bulgarian Empire rose back to prominence. He even channeled the spirit of Can Crum the Dreadful, the guy from the last video who drank wine from the skulls of his enemies, by earning his own badass nickname. The Rose. Though it's a slightly less badass nickname when you consider that it was a name he gave himself. After the Byzantine Emperor Basil II had earned the nickname the Bulgar Slayer because of how he defeated Samuel in 1014, Kaloyan decided to name himself the Roman Slayer because of his decisive victories over the Byzantine Empire. I guess he was trying to be ironic and funny in a 13th century kind of way. Following Kaloyan's rule, the Second Bulgarian Empire continued to lose and gain land on the fringes of its dominion. Then, in 1277, something almost unprecedented happened. A peasant farmer from the northern part of the Bulgarian Empire led a peasant uprising against the Second Bulgarian Empire and demanded that he be the new ruler. Amazingly, this peasant, Ivalo, very briefly became recognised as the Emperor of Bulgaria. Just think about that for a moment. From about the 10th century to the 14th century, much of Europe operated under a feudal landlord system. The vast majority of Europeans from Bulgaria to Britain were peasant farmers like Ivalo, who worked the land on behalf of their landlords. The aristocracy were the rulers, and most of them were married to each other, at least in Western Europe anyway. Then, out of nowhere, this nobody rises up from the dirt and takes the crown away from a corrupt monarchy filled with backstabbing and bad rulers. While this story is pretty incredible, it has been exaggerated. For example, when Bulgaria became a socialist regime in the 20th century, the socialists in charge often pointed to Ivalo as a historical example of socialism. The socialists pointed to Ivalo as a historical example of someone rejecting the whole idea of Bulgarian monarchy just as they were doing so. The issue of this is that much like some historians' tendency to view Jesus as a political revolutionary, this is an anachronistic view of history. There is no evidence that Ivalo wanted to institute political reform. Ivalo's issue wasn't with the Second Bulgarian Empire itself. The man wanted to become emperor, and had he lived, he probably would have passed power through his family too. Rather, Ivalo's issue was with the chopping and changing of bad rulers since Ivan Assen II's death in 1241. And he had a point. In the 35 years before Ivalo's revolution, six different emperors had been in charge. Three were murdered, two fled the empire, and the one emperor who ruled for longer than five years during that period, Constantine I, was completely useless. He lost land, lost popularity, and killed many noblemen in his inner circle. By contrast, Ivalo was popular, so much so that a couple peasant revolts took place in the Byzantine Empire inspired by Ivalo. It's sort of like how when a League 2 football team beats a Premiership football team and everyone else is inspired by it just because it's so great to see the underdogs win. But the underdogs don't stay on top for long and Ivalo's reign never really begun. Though he made it to Veliko Tarnovo and though he was technically emperor for a spell, he was quickly replaced by a new dynasty. During the late 13th century and some of the 14th century after Ivalo's revolution, the Second Bulgarian Empire went through something of a second golden age, a series of good rulers and a peaceful transition of power from one to the next made it seem like the Bulgarian Empire could last forever. Then the Ottomans arrived, and by the end of the 14th century, the Second Bulgarian Empire fell to the Ottoman Empire after 48 years of solid fighting. Just as with the Norman conquest of England, the Ottoman conquest created a whole new social order. More so than ever before, the Bulgarians were now ruled by outside forces. The Byzantines weren't Bulgarian, but they had a shared culture. By contrast, the Ottomans were a completely new kind of ruler. In short, life under the Ottomans was different. So different, in fact, that it deserves its own video. As such, we'll talk about that next time. For now, however, thanks for watching.